James and the Giant Peach, Chapter 22 In a few minutes, everything was ready. It was very quiet now on top of the peach. There was nobody in sight. Nobody except the earthworm. One half of the earthworm, looking like a great, thick, juicy pink sausage, lay innocently in the sun for all the seagulls to see. The other half of him was dangling down in the tunnel. James was crouching close beside the earthworm in the tunnel entrance, just below the surface, waiting for the first seagull. He had a loop of silk string in his hands. The old green grasshopper and the ladybird were further down the tunnel, holding on to the earthworm's tail, ready to pull him quickly in, out of danger, as soon as James gave the word. And far below, in the great stone of the peach, the glowworm was lighting up the room so that the two spinners, the silkworm and the spider, could see what they were doing. The centipede was down there too, exhorting them both frantically to greater efforts, and every now and again James could hear his voice coming up faintly from the depths, shouting, Spin, silkworm, spin! You lazy brute! Faster, faster! I will throw you to the sharks! Here comes the first seagull, whispered James. Keep still now, earthworm. Keep still. The rest of you, get ready to pull. Please don't let it spike me begged the earthworm. I won't, I won't. Shh! Out of the corner of one eye, James watched the seagull as it came swooping down towards the earthworm. And then suddenly it was so close that he could see its small black eyes and its curved beak, and its beak was open, ready to grab a nice piece of flesh out of the earthworm's back. Pull! shouted James. The old green grasshopper and the ladybird gave the earthworm's tail an enormous tug, and like magic, the earthworm disappeared into the tunnel. At the same time, up went James's hand, and the seagull flew right into the loop of silk that he was holding out. The loop, which had been cleverly made, tightened just at the right amount, but not too much, around its neck, and the seagull was captured. Hooray! shouted the old green grasshopper, peering out of the tunnel. Well done, James! Up flew the seagull with James paying out the silk string as it went. He gave it about 50 yards and then tied the string to the stem of the peach. Next one! he shouted, jumping back into the tunnel. Up you get again, earthworm! Bring up some more silk, centipede! Oh, I don't like this at all! wailed the earthworm. It only just missed me! I even felt the wind on my back as it went swishing past! Shh! whispered James. Keep still. Here comes another one. So they did it again. And again. And again. And again. And the seagulls kept coming, and James caught them one after the other, and tethered them to the peach stem. One hundred seagulls, he shouted, wiping the sweat from his face. Keep going, they cried. Keep going, James. Two hundred seagulls. Three hundred seagulls. Four hundred seagulls. The sharks, as though sensing they were in danger of losing their prey, were hurling themselves at the peach more furiously than ever, and the peach was sinking lower and lower still into the water. Five hundred seagulls! James shouted. Silkworm says she's running out of silk, yelled the centipede from below. She says she can't keep it up much longer, nor can Miss Spider. Tell them they've got to! James answered. They can't stop now. We're lifting, somebody shouted. No, we're not. I felt it. Put on another seagull, quick. Quiet, everybody, quiet. Here's one coming now. This was the 501st seagull, and the moment that James caught it and tethered it to the stem with all the others, the enormous peach suddenly started rising up, slowly out of the water. Look out, here we go. Hold on, boys! But then it stopped, and there it hung. It hovered and swayed, but it went no higher. The bottom of it was just touching the water. It was like a delicately balanced scale that needed only the tiniest push to tip it one way or the other. One more will do it! shouted the old green grasshopper, looking out of the tunnel. We're almost there! And now came the big moment. 
Quickly, the 502nd seagull was caught and harnessed to the peach stem. And then suddenly, but slowly, majestically, like some fabulous golden balloon, with all the seagulls straining at the strings above, the giant peach rose up, dripping out of the water, and began climbing towards the heavens. Chapter 23 in a flash, everybody was up on top. Oh, isn't it beautiful, they cried. What a marvellous feeling. Goodbye, sharks. Oh boy, this is the way to travel. Miss Spider, who was literally squealing with excitement, grabbed the centipede by the waist and the two of them started dancing round and round the peach stem. The earthworm stood up on his tail and did a sort of wriggle of joy all by himself. The old green grasshopper kept hopping higher and higher in the air. The ladybird rushed over and shook James warmly by the hand. The glowworm, who at the best of times was a very shy and silent creature, sat glowing with pleasure near the tunnel entrance. Even the silkworm, looking white and thin and completely exhausted, came creeping out of the tunnel to watch this miraculous ascent. Up and up they went, and soon they were as high as the top of a church steeple above the ocean. I am a bit worried about the peach, James said to the others as soon as all the dancing and shouting had stopped. I wonder how much damage those sharks have done to it underneath. It's quite impossible to tell from up here. Why don't I go over the side and make an inspection, Miss Spider said. It'll be no trouble at all, I assure you. And without waiting for an answer, she quickly produced a length of silk thread and attached the end of it to the peach stem. I'll be back in a jiffy, she said, and then she walked calmly over to the edge of the peach and jumped off, paying out the thread behind her as she fell. The others crowded anxiously around the place where she had gone over. Wouldn't it be dreadful if the thread broke, the ladybird said. There was a rather long silence. Are you all right, Miss Spider? shouted the old green grasshopper. Yes, thank you, her voice answered from below. I'm coming up now. And up she came, climbing foot over foot, over the silk thread, and at the same time tucking the thread back cleverly into her body as she climbed past it. Is it awful? they asked her. Is it all eaten away? Are there great holes in it everywhere? Miss Spider clambered back onto the deck, and with a pleased but also a rather puzzled look on her face. You won't believe this, she said, but there's actually hardly any damage down there at all. The peach is almost untouched. There are just a few tiny pieces out of it here and there, but nothing more. You must be mistaken, James told her. Of course she's mistaken, the centipede said. I promise you I I'm not, Miss Spider answered. But there were hundreds of sharks around us. I don't care what you saw, Miss Spider answered. There certainly didn't do much damage to the peach. Then why did we start sinking? The centipede asked. Perhaps we didn't start sinking, the old green grasshopper suggested. Perhaps we were all so frightened that we simply imagined it. This, in fact, was closer to the truth than any of them knew. A shark, you see, has an extremely long nose, and its mouth is set very awkwardly underneath its face and a long way back. This makes it more or less impossible for it to get its teeth into a vast, smooth, curving surface such as the side of a peach. Even if the creature turns on its back, it still can't do it, because the nose always gets in the way. If you have ever seen a small dog trying to get its teeth into an enormous ball, then you will be able to imagine roughly how it was with the sharks and the peach. It must have been some kind of magic, the ladybird said. The holes must have healed up by themselves. <gasps> Look, there's a ship below us, shouted James. Everybody rushed to the side and peered over. None of them had ever seen a ship before. It looks like a big one. <gasps> it's got three funnels. You can even see people on the decks. Let's wave to them. Do you, do you think they can see us? Neither James nor any of the others knew about it, but the ship that was now passing beneath them was actually the Queen Mary, sailing out of the English Channel 
on her way to America. And on the bridge of the Queen Mary, the astonished captain was standing with a group of his officers, all of them gaping at the great round ball hovering overhead. I don't like it, the captain said. Nor do I, said the first officer. Do you think it's following us? said the second officer. I tell you, I don't like it, muttered the captain. It could be dangerous. That's it, cried the captain. It's a secret weapon. Holy cats! Send a message to the Queen at once. The country must be warned and give me my telescope. The first officer handed the telescope to the captain. The captain put it to his eye. There's birds everywhere, he cried. The whole sky is teeming with birds. What in the world are they doing? And wait, wait a second. There are people on it. I, I can see them moving. There's a... Uh, do I have this darn thing focused right? It looks like a little boy in short trousers. Yes, I can distinctly see a little boy in short trousers standing up there. And there's... There's a... A sort of giant ladybird. Now, just one minute, Captain the first officer said, and a colossal green grasshopper. Captain, the first officer said sharply, Captain, please. And, and a mammoth spider. Oh dear, he's been at the whiskey again, whispered the second officer. And an enormous, a, a simply enormous centipede, screamed the captain. Call the ship's doctor, the first officer said. Our captain is not well. A moment later, the great round ball disappeared into a cloud and the people on the ship never saw it again.